Hello, my name is Deb Arns and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Museum of Nebraska History and our June 2007 Brown Bag Lecture Series. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to take a moment to thank the Nebraska State Historical, so Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these programs. Today's speaker is Sharon Kennedy. She's the Interim Curator and Director of the Statewide Art Connections at the Sheldon Art Gallery. She's also the curator of the exhibit Nebraska Women Artists here at the Museum of Nebraska History. Her talk today is on just that topic and is also entitled Nebraska Women Artists. So please join me in welcoming Sharon Kennedy. It is my pleasure to be here today. I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society and the museum for giving me this opportunity. I do appreciate it. I wrote my thesis on early Nebraska women artists, 1880 to 1950, back in 2000. And my talk today will include 11 of those 12 women that I researched back then. I will also be talking a little bit about some of the artists that are included in this exhibition that were not in my thesis. My focus is on the artists, their career, and just as important, their contribution to uh, the development of the art culture in the state of Nebraska. Through their involvement with local artist guilds and development of sketch clubs, they encouraged participation in the arts within art communities. By establishing art organizations, they help to develop art collections and host exhibitions, including notable artists from the East Coast. Under their leadership as art instructors and administrators, the art department became a viable, independent entity of higher education in Nebraska. And in addition to exhibiting their work in museums, salons, world fairs, they accepted national and international commissions and participated in the Public Works for Art project or the WPA project of the 1930s. Many women practicing in Nebraska attended prestigious art schools, such as the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts, the Julian Academy in Paris, the Art Student League in New York, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and many of them at the Art Institute of Chicago. They sought out and studied under artists such as William Merritt Chase, Cecilia Bowe, Berger Sanzan, and Hans Hoffman. And you'll see the influence of these artists in their work. The dominant style was uh, particularly portrait and um, commissioned portrait realistic in style. And as time goes on, you'll see more of an individualized expressionistic style develop. We see ranges from Impressionism, Regionalism, Cubism, and geometric forms in their work. The opening of the University of Nebraska in 1871, followed by Peru Normal School in 1895, the Nebraska Normal School at Kearney in 1905, and the Nebraska State Normal School in Chadron in 1910, and later the University of Omaha offered opportunities for these women to come to uh, higher education, practice their art while teaching. And you'll see that in, in the predominance of women in the art department in many of those early years. Before we get started with those, those women in the institutions, though, I'd like to point you to this work on the wall by Sally Cover. This is a work in the Nebraska State Historical Society collection. And Sally Cover was married to a homesteader in 1878 here in Garfield County. She was commissioned by her neighbor, Ellsworth Ball, to paint their homestead. And as you can see, it's an image that is not so much, um, well, you might say not so much, uh, she wasn't educated perhaps in, in the area of art. It's more of a primitive style, but we certainly see a, a real attention to detail. And certainly, it's a helpful document in, in de determining what homesteads really looked like. 
I also want to mention another artist that I don't have an image of, but you can see her work in an illustration in a book out in this exhibition, Suzette Lafleche Tibbles, who was born in 1854 and died in 1903. She was a lecturer, a writer, and an artist for the Omaha tribe, and she is probably best known for serving as Standing Bear's interpreter during the 19, excuse me, 1879 trial in Omaha. And she also assisted him on tours of the eastern United States. She was born in Bellevue. She worked with the newspaperman Thomas H. Tibbles to publicize the Ponca, uh, the plight of the Ponca Indians. And she continued to be an advocate for Native Americans much of her life. Another one of our most significant contributors to the art community in Nebraska was Sarah Wool Moore, who came to the university in 1884 from Packer Collegiate Institute in Brooklyn, New York. She was also a student at the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. And she had a strong determination to create an art culture in a town where previously little had existed. She wrote numerous letters to the regents to show her commitment, you might say, to the university, one proposed that the course fees be kept low, quote, to develop a real art culture, which must always be created. She also asked that the university assume the risk and make the teacher stipend a respectable sum in order to recruit and maintain a staff of qualified educators. And her success can be seen in the number of students that attended her classes. When she started, 46 students enrolled. Her class grew to 115 by the year 1889, and in 1892, 147 students were signed up for painting and drawing classes. Moore also organized the Hayden Art Club. Excuse me. <coughs> which later became the Nebraska Art Association. This was in 1888. Nebraska Art Association is the support organization for the Sheldon Memorial Art Gallery. <clears throat> this painting is of Charles Gear. Some of you might recognize him. He was a prominent man in Lincoln, an attorney responsible for passing or helping to pass legislation that created the university and the Nebraska State Historical Society, a founder of the what is now the Lincoln Journal Star. And this is clearly a commissioned portrait, very realistic in style, very precise and accurate, and certainly portrays him as a prominent person. <clears throat> We're not sure what happened to Sarah Moore after she left the university in 1892. We found one publication the next year called In a Woman, it was a publication called A Woman of the Century, and it said that Moore uh, was credited for, quote, quickening and development of artistic taste in Nebraska. She left for a special study and rest. So perhaps we wore her out. <laughs> <laughs> she was replaced the next year by Cora Parker, Cora Parker, who came here from the Cincinnati Art School and the Julian Academy in Paris. So again, wonderful credentials. She had studied under William Merritt Chase. And let me just give you an example of her work here. This is called Golden Hair. It's a pastel and clearly a much more relaxed style, you might say, almost impressionistic. There's certainly a freedom in color as well in this particular piece, much less precise. Parker's tenure, tenure at the university was a little more difficult. It appears there were some financial issues and in the end, the Hayden Art Club paid for her salary during her time here, actually up until 1899 when she resigned in order to save her reputation. In a letter to <laughs> Chancellor McLean of the Regents, she said that if, if they were to drop her before she resigned, it would put her in, quote, an unjust light. And so she left Lincoln, went back to uh, Greenwich, Connecticut to work for the Bruce Museum of Art. Replacing Cora Parker was Sarah Sewell Hayden, 
who was born and raised in Chicago, attended the Chicago Art Institute, studied with William Merritt Chase and Frank Duvenick. She also taught at several institutions before coming to the university and traveled, exhibited her work internationally, and um, including places like Belgium, Holland, England, and Italy. So she, again, another person with some wonderful credentials. In 1905, after being at the university for about six years, she took a one-year leave of absence to study with William Merritt Chase in Spain. Uh, they were going to do landscape painting and uh, study masterpieces at the Prado, so quite an opportunity. She came back and painted this painting, Girl in Green, which you can see in the exhibition today, while she was living here in Lincoln. We know this is a student of hers by the name of Krita Warner Philly from Roca, Nebraska. However, her identity isn't real clear in this particular image, so I think we could safely say that it's not necessarily a commissioned portrait. But we can see some of the Chase school, I, I would say, some of the influences from William Merritt Chase in, in the brush strokes, in the romantic qualities of this piece, um, the light source, the uh, contrasting elements and textural qualities of the green dress, and of course the atmosphere that, that is created. So Hayden served all total 17 years at the university. She retired in 1916 at the age of 60 and returned to her old address in Chicago. I also want to mention Augusta Knight. I don't have an image for Augusta, but you can see a small Christmas card that she created out in this exhibition. It's a beautiful little ink drawing. And I want to mention her because she was so significant in, the, in her contribution to the state of Nebraska, particularly Omaha, where she arrived in 1909, took a teaching position at Brownell Talbot, what's now Brownell Talbot School, and then went on to the University of Omaha to organize their art department. She remained the chairperson there for more than 15 years and also gained national recognition for her work in the instruction of kindergarten teachers. She was very active in the Omaha Art Guild and exhibited widely, uh, including Chicago Art Institute and Jocelyn Art Museum. I also want to mention Mona Nyhart. I don't know that we can call her necessarily a Nebraskan born and true, but I, I think she needs to be noted. She lived here for 12 years, and she married our poet laureate, John Nyhart. Uh, her story is very interesting, too. She attended private schools in New York studied voice and violin in Germany, began taking sculpture lessons in New York from Frank Edwin Elwell, Elwell, who was the curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and studied three years under Auguste Rodin in Paris, which is quite impressive. She read A Bundle of Myrrh by John Nyhart and was so impressed with it that she decided she'd write him a letter. They started corresponding and wrote to each other for six months. And in November 1908, they met at a train station in Omaha, and they were married the following day. <laughs> they made their home in Bancroft, where John built her a studio for her sculpture work. Much of her work is, is more personal in style. There's certainly a number of pieces of family members, and you can find a bust in the exhibition today. next artist is Elizabeth Tuttle Holzman, who was born in Brownville, Nebraska, and earned her education at the University of Nebraska, where she then became a faculty member, and later went on to attend the Chicago Art Institute to further her education. She met her husband there, who was an architect, and more or less stayed in Chicago, but I include her in my research because she had such a strong connection to Nebraska and some of her work remains here today. She traveled extensively and studied uh, subject matter in various locations and ways. I, this is obviously a painting, but she was really well known for her sculpture and that's how we know her on the campus today. As you can see, her paintings were rather impressionistic in style. Uh, we have a real freedom of color here again, too, with the purples and greens. 
and certainly a strong sense of vibrancy and freshness in this particular piece. She exhibited her work in Chicago 15 times at the Art Institute between 1898 and 1937. So she was clearly an active artist all her life. She was commissioned to do a work in 1917 for the University of Nebraska, Bessie Hall, in memory of Dr. C.E. Bessie. And you can find that work on campus today in Bessie Hall. She was also commissioned to do a memorial for Dean Amanda Reese in Reese Hall. And she was credited as creating some very successful commissions, praised for being sincere, sympathetic, and having careful craftsmanship. The next artist is Alice Ryder Edmiston. This is a photograph of her on her 50th wedding anniversary. She was born in Wisconsin, but came to the University of Nebraska to study, and then on to the Art Institute. She also went to New York for a year and studied at the Art Student League under Frank Dumont, Vincent Dumont, and then took a summer trip to Paris where she spent a lovely nine months studying on the Latin Quarter and in artist studios. She then came back to the university and taught for a year, remained very active. She uh, exhibited in the Trans-Mississippi Exposition in Omaha in 1898. She was very active in the Nebraska Art Association and became president of the Lincoln Artists Guild, continuing her membership throughout her life. She also traveled quite a bit. And this particular piece that's in the exhibition from a private collection is called Provincetown Church and probably Provincetown, Massachusetts. We see here a very different style from what we've seen previous, more of a geometric, almost cubist-like style with very unusual coloring, nice shadows. We've got a certain sense of depth in this piece. Alice also exhibited at Joslyn. She was given a one-person show there of her monotypes. She's in the Chicago Art Institute's collection today, as well as the Sheldon Memorial Art Gallery and Nebraska Museum of Nebraska Art in Kearney. I also want to mention an artist who I do not have an image of, who I did some research on. I'll just briefly mention her. She's not in this exhibition because very little of her work exists today. She was mainly a graphic artist, and um, we know of one painting in Arizona. She was, her name, Angel Decora Dietz, and her Dates are 1871 to 1919. She was born on the Winnebago Reservation in what's today Thurston County, Nebraska. And her, autobiog her autobiography states that she left on a white man's train to attend a white man's school, um, being separated from her parents at a pretty young age. She went to the Hampton Normal and Agriculture Institute near Norfolk, Virginia and later the Drexel Institute in Philadelphia, and studied under Howard Pyle, who some of you may recognize that name. Her big break came when some of her work was accepted at Harp in Harper's Weekly. And from there, she, she opened her own studio in Boston, moved on to New York City, and became quite successful. Later, she was asked by the government to develop an art program for the Carlisle Indian School. And she did accept, expressing, though, that she would not be expected to teach in the white man's ways, but, quote, in the art of my own race. When Howard Pyle was later asked if he had a genius student in his years of teaching, it was Decora that he spoke of when he said yes once, but unfortunately she was a woman, and still more unfortunately an American Indian. Despite these setbacks, Decora was honored with having two works at the Paris Salon in 1910. And today her archives can be found at Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia. Our next artist some of you will recognize, probably the most well-known Nebraska woman artist in these early years, Elizabeth Honor Dolan, who was born in Iowa but came to the University of Nebraska to attend. Uh, in 1899. Her instructor was Sarah Hayden, 
one of the previous instructors we talked about. She then graduated from the Art Institute of Chicago, went on to the Art Student League in New York, and became a designer of stained glass windows for Tiffany during those years in New York. She also later went back to New York to exhibit her work in the 1939 World's Fair. After New York, she moved to France. She earned a scholarship to the American School of Art at Fontainebleau and exhibited at the Paris Salon in 1925. On her way back from France, she heard about a new state museum of natural history that was to be built in Lincoln in honor of University Regent C.H. Morrill of Stromsburg, Nebraska. And in 1927, she signed a contract with the museum director, Dr. E.H. Barbour, offering her $100 a week to paint murals for the newly mounted exhibitions. It was a 15-month project that certainly gave her the reputation as a muralist. And you can see more of her work in the state capitol. This is Spirit of the Prairie. There are certainly other commissions. There were 10 murals at Miller and Payne department store at one time. Also at the old Unitarian Church on 12th and H Street, the University Club, the Women's Lounge in Nebraska Union, which is still there, the Bennett Martin Library, also still in existence, 10 murals at the Masonic Temple. I know a few of those still exist. The YWCA in Lincoln the old Bancroft School, and several private homes. She was also given a 24-piece one-woman show at the Joslin Art Museum in 1937. And she was uh, commissioned to do a number of works for the collectors Frank M. and Anna Hall. And this was their home. This piece is called The Hall Garden at 4 p.m. Some of you know that residence on 11th and D Street here in town. So you can see with her numerous commissions, she was the one artist who could uh, be a full-time artist, who could actually support herself through her art. But we, we do know that she lived a very modest life, living in the old Oliver Theater on 13th and O Street. She died in 1948 at the age of 77. Kearney Normal School became the home of Marion Canfield Smith for 38 years. She was actually the founder of the art department in Kearney and was described by students as a kind, sympathetic, dedicated, and witty person. She taught at Lincoln High School for several years and in 1901 she traveled to the University of Chile in Santiago and stayed there for three years. She also did some the time worked at the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota for several summers. She grew interested in the Pine Ridge Reservation and actually created some wonderful portraits of Native American people that's now housed at the Museum of Nebraska Art in Kearney. This is called a cornfield and uh, I think that's obvious but it certainly is an abstracted piece. I mean it's, it gives the appearance almost of being out of focus. Uh, a lot of the image imagery in the piece is somewhat implied, the pumpkins, the, the grasses, the um, greenery, but um, clearly there's more of an uh, expressionistic um, style, you might say. You can certainly see the, the brush strokes, the emphasis on brush strokes in this particular piece. She retired from Kearney State College in 1943 at the age of 70. And it's believed that much of her work is in private hands today because she traded paintings for her living expenses. And uh, she lived to be 98, so excuse me, 97. This next painting is by Alice Cleaver, who probably could have supported herself through her art as well. She was doing very well in Paris when World War I broke out, and she was forced to, to leave and return to her hometown of Fall City, Nebraska. Cleaver had attended the university and took her classes under Cora Parker, who we spoke of earlier. She then earned a scholarship to the Chicago Art Institute, graduated with honors in 1904, and went on to the Philadelphia Academy of Arts, where she studied with William Merritt Chase and Cecilia Bow. After Philadelphia, we believe she went to New Mexico a couple of times with the Santa Fe Railroad. It was a program where they offered artists um, 
transportation, free transportation if they traded paintings. It's quite a deal for the railroad, I think. But she went to Paris then in 1913, and this is where I think we see kind of a change in her style. This particular painting is in Fall City, Nebraska. It's called The Ironing Girl. And it's a beautiful painting, one of my favorites, and this black and white doesn't do it a lot of justice, but gives you some idea of her skill. It certainly is a, more of a, a genre painting, something a little different um, th than what we've seen so far. Again, as I mentioned, she was very successful in Paris, being included in a number of pretty prestigious exhibitions there before returning to Nebraska. Also kind of an interesting story about Alice Cleaver. She had met the poet and student Nicholas Vachel Lindsay, who some of you might know, uh, while she was in Chicago. They were both in Philadelphia and New York together as well. And when she moved back to Fall City, uh, it's understood that Vachel Lindsay came to visit her. He actually walked from Illinois to New Mexico. This was kind of a, a thing to do. Um, back in those days, but he was turned away by her father at the door. And, and there were also numerous letters that he attempted to write to Alice, uh, but it's believed her mother Rosa intercepted the letters. Uh, after the last family member died in the household, a box of letters was found, and several of them were from Lindsay, so they were unopened. This particular photograph I found in the archives in Lindsay's um, files in Hamp uh, at the University of Virginia, excuse me. Uh, this is Alice Cleaver. The back is uh, titled Alice Cleaver and the date 1903. Just this spring, I gave a talk in Fall City and learned that Lindsay has another archive in Ohio. Harem College in Ohio, and this painting of Alice Cleaver, this is a self-portrait, was found in his archives in Ohio. This is clearly the same person. The, uh, it's a real likeness in the photograph and this painting, the French knot, is identical. <laughs> so, but it's clear it's her too, it's also signed. Our next artist is Gladys Lux, who uh, I'm sure Many people in this audience know of Gladys as well. Born near Chapman, Nebraska. Came back to Lincoln to accept a position at Nebraska Wesleyan University where she spent the next 40 years. She uh, pursued her master's while she was teaching there and also applied for the Public Work of Art project, the WPA project in the 30s and she was accepted but six months later it was pulled out from under her, uh, the money was given to an artist that supposedly had more of a financial need. So she, she was never paid for the paintings she did. She also went out to Shadron State College to uh, teach in the summertime. And it was here that she learned of this event happening. This is the, uh, an event that happened in the Black Hills, a stratus, the first stratospheric balloon experiment uh, that was sponsored by the National Geographic Society. And it was really an exciting event and she came home uh, back to Shadron, taught her class the next morning and then painted this by memory. And it's really quite a successful painting, very abstract, quite different from the work she was doing in the 1930s that you can imagine was sort of the regionalist dust bowl era type of paintings. Lux was head of the art department at Wesleyan, often the only member on the art faculty. While she was there, she organized a number of exhibitions. She opened the Little Gallery, where she also headed up um, a number of shows. She was active in the Lincoln Artists Guild. She collected work as well. We know that um, because she's got a number of her things at the, the Lux Center today. And, of course, also interested in buildings, had a bit of real estate, bought the old University Place City Hall in Northeast Lincoln by Wesleyan University, and of course today that is the Lux Center for the Arts. I want to mention that Alice also won numerous awards, the Governor's Arts Awards, the Mayor Arts Awards, Nebraska Art Teachers Association, quite an active 
and talented woman. She died in, in excuse me, 2003 at the age of 104. This is Katie Faulkner, or Catherine Faulkner, who came to the university to teach. She was actually born in Syracuse, New York, had attended the Art Student League, uh, but came here and taught for 20 years. She, during the summertime, uh, took lessons from Hans Hoffman back in New York City. She also studied under Boardman Robinson and Henry Varnum Poor. She was quoted as saying that an art instructor's um, teaching should always come, quote, before their own creative work. But despite this philosophy, she was very ambitious in her own exhibitions. Between 1936 and 40, she exhibited in more than 50 shows. This is another shot of Katie. This is called Lime Mill, and it gives you some idea of a little bit of the range of her work. It was often regionalist in style, but here you can see her kind of experimenting with some geometric lines and forms as well, and very active printmaker. Another piece by uh, Katie that's out here in this exhibition is called Nebraska Farm. It's part of the Great Plains Art Collection. And here I think we really see that regionalist style coming out. We are, our eyes are brought to the focal point of the piece by the uh, tracks, the what, whatever they are, tractor tracks or wagon tracks. Um, there's some real soft, billowy clouds there that are kind of repeated in the, the tufts of white that look like chickens. And so we've got a real peaceful prairie type of image going on here. Faulkner was also uh, chosen by the WPA project to do a mural in Valentine, Nebraska. Got an image of that as well uh, for their post office. It was called End of the Trail. Raised a little bit of controversy like a lot of public art does. Uh, many of the local people felt that this city girl didn't understand the, the types of trees, the landscape as well as she should have, although she did make n numerous trips out there. But the mural still exists today. The post office has moved, but it's still there, so it couldn't have been all that bad. She's uh, worked with, and many of you will recognize this name too, Dwight Kirsch in the University Department of Art. They developed the art department together. They also are credited for developing a relationship between the school and the Nebraska Art Association. She left in 1950, went to Wisconsin, and took a job with the uh, Episcopalian boarding school called the Kemper Hall. When she died, uh, Kemper Art Center was opened in her name. This was a dream that Katie Faulkner always had, so, so it certainly was a dream come true. This final piece is Myra Biggerstaff. And Myra Biggerstaff was from Auburn, Nebraska. She studied with Berger Sanzen at Bethany College in Kansas in the 19. 20s, late 20s. Then she went uh, to Paris for a year in Sweden. She actually uh, coordinated an exhibition with Berger Sanzan in, in Sweden and attended the Swedish Royal Academy. In 1950, she decided to take the leap and went to New York City to become a full-time painter. She had a very ambitious first year where she painted 29 portraits and uh, also finished up her master's degree at Columbia University. She attended the Fashion Institute of Technology and later took a job there to support herself. I think it's always a difficult task to be a full-time artist and living in New York City. And she stayed there until her retirement. During that time, she was given a solo exhibition and she retired in 1972. I actually ended up returning to Auburn, Nebraska. She told a newspaper reporter that painting is my first love. And this particular piece is probably the most radical, I guess you could say, in style. It's, it's very abstract. If you didn't know it was called the studio late afternoon, you might not recognize it as an artist's studio. It's made up of lines and shapes and colors, basically. So good example of... Um, a, a more of a freedom of style. And I guess in conclusion, I'd like to say that we certainly, if you think back to that first image we saw 
uh, by Sally Cover, and then uh, the the commissioned piece of Charles Gere in a very um, formal style, and then compare that to this piece. We're talking 1880 in those earlier pieces, and now 1950. We see a, a huge change and, and much of a freedom of expression being seen. Also, if you think back to those early instructors, Sarah Moore, Cora Parker, and Sarah Hayden, uh, you see three women who came here to augment their careers as artists by teaching. These women certainly paved the way for other artists, and today we have women who are making similar choices and similar sacrifices, and progress certainly continues to be made. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Mm -hmm. information on the composition of their classes is, are the art classes almost exclusively female students or are they really a mixed group? You know, I think it was a mixed group. I think it was a mixed group and, and I know that early on it was just art and later it became art history classes as well. But I, I imagine it was predominantly women. It would be I, interesting to do a, sort a of comparison. Sort of see whether they're really training female students Mm -hmm. or to what degree we had you know, male students in those classes. Right, and then to compare that to today's numbers as well. We know today that there are, there are more women taking art classes than men, but it's pretty close. It's, it, the last time I checked the statistics, they were just a, women above 50%, but not, not a lot, so kind of, kind of even. Other questions? How many of those women have their names tied to buildings or groups on campus? Can, can you think of any? Right off the... I was thinking of the Hayden Gallery over in the Haymarket. Is that mm -hmm. no. Uh, no. It's not it's her, Hayden. right. No. It is a different Hayden. That's right. It's uh, spelled differently. Hers is spelled H-A-Y-D-E. And if this was... And Karen, maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. This... Robert Hayden, the there British painter. Very good. You mentioned also a Kemper Art Center in Wisconsin. Yes. Some of us just went to Kansas City yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where in Wisconsin is the Kemper? It's Kenosha. Kenosha, Wisconsin. And, and it was actually called Kemper Hall. Let's see if I've got the... Kemper Hall is where she taught and... I don't know that there's a connection. I kind of doubt it, but that's worth worth a look. Let's see here. Yes, Kemper Arts Center, part of the Greater Kenosha Arts Council. Yes. Do you know or can you speculate about how these women may have stood out from their contemporaries in these art classes. I mean, were these classes devoted to training professional artists, or were they devoted to painting as one of the domestic arts that would separate women's classes right. from men's classes? Well, that's a good point, I, and a good question. I, one thing I think of is that several of the women that I talk about later, like after we talk about those first three women that really made some, some changes in, in the development of the departments. We go on and, and five or six of the, the women that follow happen to be students of, of these early women and they went on to do some pretty big things. In, in my eyes, you know, more than, more than domestic, as a matter of fact, only four out of the 12 women I did my research on married. Uh, they, they, you know, I'm certainly something they'd want to think about seriously because obviously uh, that, that meant a, you know, quite a commitment to your family and, and could you do both? I mean, we all know how difficult that is today. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know exactly 
And it would be interesting to know, you know, if it also how many of them were just taking an art class, you know, because it was an elective that, and, and that they weren't serious about going on. I, I imagine a good number of them. But somehow, Sarah Moore managed to rope them, <laughs> you know, into this class, and I just, I find the numbers pretty staggering, really. I, it's amazing. You know, back then, what, what would you do with, I mean, how, how could you be real serious about art? <laughs> Other questions? Well, this isn't really a question, but it's just looking at this painting that's uh, still on the, the screen yeah. and comparing that to the Provincetown, there's so many similarities between the colors and the shapes that's and so many years in between. Yeah, that's a very good point. And you'll have to go out and look at those in the exhibition because they're both, they're both out there that might be worth, worth a look. And this is a watercolor, and that's a painting, but, but you're right, there's a real a real freedom of color. There's, there's clearly a, a more of a cubist bent to those. Good point. Other comments, too. I, I'll take comments as well. We, one thought I would have also is that while the last painting is the most radical in terms of what you've shown, if you're thinking New York City, 1950, you're thinking Jackson Pollock has already shown his early canvases, and so in some ways, it's still a conservative image within the time frame. Good point. Yes? I'll have to remind that um, Lana Neihardt's bust of John Neihardt is in the Capitol uh, Hall of Fame, so if anybody wants to come and see that bust, uh, very good. Thank you. That's a, that, that's a great point. And you should, it is, that, you know, because what we have out here is a plaster cast, but what you could see, and, and the Nebraska State Historical Society has other pieces by her. They're just, they were just not available for this exhibition. But, but yes, go, go to the state capitol and see a number of gems. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>